of Divorce Not Dead. And today I am very excited about today's podcast, actually, for a multitude of reasons. And I'm joined by Candice Horback, um, who used to be an adult film star. Am I right? Yes. And now yes. you do wellness retreats. It couldn't be like polar opposite. I'm absolutely fascinated. And my current husband is gutted he's not here right now. Oh, no. <laughs> We'll miss him in the conversation. Yes. Um, well, he's in, he's in Bali looking at wellness retreats. There you are. Um, so we're really into all of that sort of going, you know, um, we, we love Bali and sort of going over there and we want to do wellness retreats and we love, absolutely love it. But I'm more fascinated in how you got there because honestly, we were having this conversation. I don't know what you wanted to talk about, but I'm fascinated about the adult sort of porn world. Just because I think so many, I actually think it's, quite a good industry to have, um, especially as a married woman, bizarrely, and I'm going to have a load of screaming women down the, you know, the monitor at me, but I don't mind porn for relationships, for my husband, for anything. I'd prefer he was watching porn than was out in a nightclub. And I'm married to a 27 year old. So, you know, he has a much higher libido than I do. Um, <laughs> sure and you, you know so I uh, porn is my friend is what I'm trying to say so um tell me more like do you think that it's good for relationships I and mean, tell you how tell me how you got into the industry tell me everything because I mean you're gorgeous I always I never quite understand why you know why people sort of end up there or is it a choice because it's got such a sort of bad rap that women are forced into porn and forced into doing all these things and actually some people are quite happy there so um Tell me your story. So I think that certainly there's uh, an amount of women and men that end up in the industry, like they they end up there, right? Like they're either there because of lack of options, lack of resources, maybe they have been lured in by some grooming techniques. So that definitely exists. But I think the mistake is, was when you talk about cr like the adult creators as a whole, that's the only section of like that uh, subset of people that we talk about. We don't talk about the people that actually chose and actively sought out the industry that's treated like a business that had a very healthy relationship with it or more positives than negative um, interactions within, within the industry. So I think you kind of have to look at both holistically if you're going to talk about it, right? So we have this really insecure relationship with like our bodies and sexuality and pleasure and specifically pornography and whether that's cheating or not. And it's, it's so complicated and requires so much nuance within the conversation that we would rather just chalk it up to all bad or it's cheating and then just and not face it and kind of let things fester. And it's like, if you want to have the industry operating above board and like ethically and treating creators properly, then you have to look into it. You have to look at the whole thing collectively and not just dismiss it right away because you have some insecurities around whatever it is regarding like the the industry itself. Um, I sought it out. So I was one person that was, you know, it, I didn't end up there. It was something that I actively wanted to participate in. I was going to university. So it's not like I did, I was, you know, in poverty. I, I had never done like quote drugs before. Like it, it goes against a lot of the narratives that I think people would kind of assume. Um, say? What was what? What did your parents say? Like you were well, so, so I guess one of the one of the areas where it's like, oh, duh, yeah, I don't have a relationship with my dad, so like, insert daddy issues here, joke here. Um, so yeah, I don't have a relationship with my father. My mom was actually she was really pissed, and not for the reasons that you would expect. I think that there was a lot of jealousy with that because. Um, the man that she was with at the time had like found my content. It wasn't my explicit stuff. So he had seen me doing an interview on like a Mark Cuban network or something. And he was watching that and he saw it and then connected the dots and was like, Hey, did you know that Candace is doing this? And then it was, it was a very big explosion. And it was, um, it was honestly an issue for a really long time. And I think it was all, I think with everything, right. It's like people are presented as mirrors for us and it's, you can either look at it as a learning opportunity and see what wound am I touching that's like instilling like this really visceral response, or you could just say I'm bad and I'm making a bad decision. Um, my mom for a long time made it more about me than about her, and I think she kind of rounded the corner in the last couple of years. But it's it's got to be hard. I mean, no, 
I don't think any parent is like, I want my my child to end up in sex work, right? Like, I don't want them to grow up and do that. I think we all want like the best. We all want our kid to be a rocket scientist or an engineer or uh, a doctor that's curing something. Or we have these very grand plans for our kid that sometimes don't align with who they are or their passions or um, what what is their spark, right? Like we're not in control of what our kids do when they grow up. So but how is going to university and doing that on the side, uh, regardless of anything, because as I said, I have quite open views, so we'll, which I'll get into you, with you later. But like for you going to school at that time, I mean, boys must have found you that you went to school with. Not as much. I'm, uh, I've always been pretty shy and introverted, like I, picking a, a seat in the classroom. I was always kind of like in the middle, but towards the back. I never like making friends was always really difficult for me. I moved around a ton as a kid. So I think socializing was really hard and I'd get a lot of anxiety, especially in like bigger classrooms. And I mean, you go to school, you're waking up at, you know, six, seven o'clock in the morning, you're throwing on a sweatpants or a dress and like, you don't look the same. Um, I wasn't getting dolled up like I was for, for scenes. Ironically, it was actually some of the professors that found out who I was, not really the students. And then that was a problem because, um, like one of the professors had like reported me, which was like, what are you reporting? So reported me and I had to go into the Dean. And then the Dean gave me like a, an hour long lecture on like my choices and what I was doing. And uh, she was like, well, you can never be an educator. And I was like, that's fine. I never wanted to be an educator. That's not even why I'm going to school. And it, I don't know. I just found the thing to be um, totally inappropriate because you're, you're not taking all of the strippers into into the dean's office and saying, what are you doing with your life? Right. What I do outside of the classroom is not the school's concern. I think actually you sum up what most married women are most afraid of, because when you think of a lot of porn stars and things like this, you think of desperate sort of ugly, a lot of ugly middle aged women um you know you have the good looking ones but you have ones that you know aren't so good looking or you think of I don't know in your mind women prefer to think of you as like I don't you know not great looking and and sort of a bit over the hill and you know with wobbly bits and you look amazing like amazing um as I said I'm very happy Sergio isn't here right now um but <laughs> at the same time we had this very funny thing because you know I mean I'm English so I was brought up um in a way for us, sex was always dirty, right? So, you know, no one discussed any of that stuff with me. I think my, you know, sex talk came from my housekeeper, frankly, um, or my father much later on. Um, but uh, when I, when we decided, you know, when I met Sergio, oh no, I didn't watch any porn, I think, till I was like 21, maybe. And I think my, my best gay friend said to me, you've never watched porn. What are you talking about? And I remember so well. We were in LA, and I was like, "Well, why would I watch porn for what? I've got a husband. I've no, I, you know, I'm not husband. Sorry, I've got a boyfriend. I, I'm fine. I don't, I, you know, what? Why would I ever watch porn? Porn for? And um, anyway, he put it on, and I watched it like a movie. Like you know, they were cutting wood, and off they went to prison, and all this rubbish, and <laughs> you know, eating my jelly tots and laughing. And I was, and it was just so funny to me. But I mean, you know, it was cool, whatever. But I mean, it's not something that I, you know, I needed to watch all the time. But then. I, you know, obviously men watch it like in the morning, in the evening, in the afternoon. And then I met Sergio and he was 24 when I met Sergio, when, when I met him and he's going to absolutely kill me for this podcast. He's just going to kill me anyway. And, you know, Sergio loves it. He absolutely loves it. The man scrolls all day long. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, and it was so funny because I'm on a group chat with my girlfriends and there was one day that Sergio came home and he goes, um, I've got an announcement. And I said, what? And he goes, I've decided I'm giving up porn. And I went, what, why? And he goes, well, you know, I don't want to be unfaithful to you. And I feel like it, you know, skews everything. And I just, you know, you're my wife. And I just, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't need it anymore. So I'm going, fuck, 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 fuck. So I'm like, you know, texting all the girlfriends on, on my, uh, you know, group chat going, worst has happened, crisis, put everything down that you're doing. And they all came to the phone. They're like, what, what's happened? I'm like, Sergio's giving up porn. And everyone's like, do you know what the fuck this means? And I'm like, of course I know what this means. It's a disaster. I won't get anything done. I'm going to have to be in the bedroom all day. 
I was like, how, so like me who doesn't even know how to look up porn properly, like I'm like on the channels trying to find new ones, trying to like, you know, whatever. Anyway, it lasted three hours. He came back and he goes, oh, you know, found him back in bed watching it. So, and I, I'm absolutely happy to have it because for me, as I said, I don't understand why women have such a problem with it because I think you actually provide a service to a lot of people. Um, and actually also it does spice up your sex. I don't know, you know, like how do you learn more things to do? It's quite educational as far as I'm concerned. Like, I mean, I, I was married 18 years before. So like now I, you know, you get used to the same things. Whereas I think when you watch that and you get involved with my partner and I now, my husband now, you know, everything goes, anything goes. We have so much more fun. I like, don't worry about what people think or anything anymore because he's so free, I suppose. So I actually think that it does you a service. But then I listened to another podcast the other day and they were saying that it's the, a disaster for men because it desensitizes them to normal sex. It means that they don't, they, when they look at, you know, and I've got boys, so I'm looking at it from both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then it produces a hormone or, or deflates a hormone or something. It means it's that not true at all. Normal, normal woman, they can't, you know, they, they, they don't get as excited. So explain that side. Like, what do you think? Because I, as I said, I'm, I, I I'm not bothered by it. I, I, mm -hmm. I actually don't understand women that are, are so up in arms that they, they, as you said, it's cheating. For me, how is it cheating? There's a computer screen, not a woman in bed with you. I don't understand the, the cheating connection either. I don't see it much different than like women that are super into the romantic movies or they're reading erotica. Like I think that's right. It's a fantasy that you're engaging in. I don't think that it's a real person that you have a connection with it's entertainment and that's what it's kind of meant to be so if you're going to sit there and kind of play like the censorship police for your spouse I feel like that's really dangerous waters to get into as well but um, as far as all of the misinformation when it comes to like pornography and testosterone and it leading to ED and desensitizing the experience with a real person I mean there's no science to back that there, and there's actually a like a ton of evidence to counter that. So Dr. Nicole Prousey is a leading sex researcher and she debunks all of this left, right, and center. And then um, you have these kind of religious organizations that are perpetuating this narrative that's not backed by science. So they say it lowers testosterone. That's actually not true. It actually raises it. Like masturbating raises your testosterone. They say that it desensitizes you to real sexual encounters. That's not true because so if you have someone um, that like grazes a part of your body, it feels different than if you do it to yourself, right? Like it's not the same. Like you can, you can distinguish between like you touching you and someone else touching you. And that's because like certain things are activated by another person and you cannot activate that yourself. I don't know what, exactly what the terminology is. I had her on my podcast a while back and I'm sure she writes about it. Um, when it comes to the neurochemistry and like all of the neurochemicals that go off for an orgasm by yourself versus with someone else, it's like lighting a match versus fireworks. So if you're going to say something is going to like desensitize you, it would actually be sex. It wouldn't be masturbating and watching pornography. So all of these things that they're using as scare tactics are not based in truth. They're not based in science. It's ba based in like religious puritanical dogma. Um, and that's fine. You get to decide what is for you, but don't lie about it. So when it comes to the relationship to ED or people that feel like they have a quote addiction to sex or pornography, it has nothing to do with um, a quote addiction or, or pornography ca causing the ED. Basically what happens when they did these studies is they found that people were, that were brought up in a conventionally conservative upbringing had a lot more shame around pleasure. So when they would go to perform, it wouldn't work. So it had nothing to do with the pornography. It had to do with their relationship to their body, sex, pleasure, original sin, all of that. And then if you compared to, um, if you compared to someone with a more liberal upbringing, the amount of times that someone was like watching porn, having sex, masturbating, it was pretty even. So there wasn't an excess happening. It was their own mind saying, I'm doing this too much because I shouldn't be doing it. So it's more of an inner dialogue than an actual um, like excessive use of whatever it is. And obviously there are some people that have a compulsion issue, right? Like people are binge eating, they, they gamble. Maybe there are like some people that will watch porn eight hours a day and like they're going raw. Like, that's not good. None of that's good, but that has nothing to do with porn. It's more of a compulsion issue that you have. I mean, so 
Uh, uh, do you have a boyfriend now? Husband. Husband. And you've been married how long? Seven years. Eight and eight this winter. Is he, did you, have you given up now everything or does he mind or, you know? No, he does. He's been with me like the, and we've been together for almost 14 years. We've got two kids. Um, like he's been with me since the beginning. So like, there's no issue. He's got no problem with my past. I don't film with other people anymore like that. I kind of put behind me, but I do still update. I still create, I still make solo content. Um, and then I obviously have my podcast as well. So like there's different facets to me, just like everyone else. And again, I think it goes to, um, like seeing the whole person and knowing someone in their entirety versus just trying to deduce them to one thing because that's easier for you. And when it comes to women who like, I'm, you know, like they have really strong negative feelings about me. It's this idea that I don't have, I don't have control over urges, right? I think it's like, she is like this sexual succubus of a woman and she is just going to take, 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 and she can't help it. And that's not the case at all. Like I have I have a ton of control over my desires and my actions and, um, you know, my decision-making, my autonomy. So I think that's probably one of the narratives that they have within themselves that is so alarming when I'm like simply existing. And, you know, I've seen, I'm really interested in this too, your wellness. So you've gone into wellness retreat, retreats because I, I saw something like this. I think um, Gwyneth Paltrow did something like this with Goop, didn't they? Where they mm -hmm. had a wellness retreat with psychedelics. Mm -hmm. is that part of this so that in a way you know that you're you're you because it's all sort of um connected for maybe people that aren't as um outgoing or to learn more about their bodies with you through through this uh what what what, are the, what do the retreats really achieve for people because i actually think there is a whole generation of people that are incredibly uptight about sex their bodies and they're missing out on everything and i don't know whether you know, um, how easy that is to change because of societal, um, you know, pressure, because we we're all told that, you know, um, you, you're meant to have one partner for the rest of your life. You're all told that, um, you know, sex is about missionary position, really. You're all told, you know, and anything else is like, you know, we're all, we're all some deviant. Um, so, you know, it's, I, but, I think a lot of women rediscover themselves in their forties. Is is does yours kind of wellness um, retreat sort of help people discover this side of themselves? So I think it's all it's all intention based, right? So you all go for different reasons. So you might we've had entrepreneur retreats, which was for people to kind of look at the decisions that they're making within business and see the trickle down effect, and then how can you how can you approach your business? with like with a sense of contribution so that could be one one could be getting rid of scarcity mindset absolutely um, uncoupling with shame and rediscovering like your own divinity within yourself and seeing pleasure is um, a gift it's not something that you're supposed to cast away so it's I think when it comes to anything that you're doing retreat wise it's you go in with your intention and it's how do you integrate that thing that you have been told is bad, right? So whether that is scarcity, sexuality, pleasure. So it's all in um, like your specific mission going in. And then also, I don't think that every single psychedelic is great for everybody, right? So you have to see like, what is the thing that you are going to heal? Listen to the shaman or the facilitator. Um, usually they'll kind of guide you in the way that what they think is going to help unlock the thing that's stuck within yourself. So it's not like one thing cures all, which I think a lot of people are doing. Like you go and ayahuasca for everyone and go and keep going to the jungle every six months instead of actually sorting out your shit. So I think that there's a fine line between going to these ret these retreats and actually integrating the process, the healing, and um, saying, how do I not go back into my old habits? How do I actually become this newer, better version of myself that I got a glimpse into versus um, I'm stuck on this healing treadmill. I think, um, you know, I, I think it's very interesting in how people are, I mean, wellness and sex and everything. I read in the newspaper today, actually, people that fuck live longer. And I believe mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and especially for men, it's really important. Yeah. And I believe, mm -hmm. I, I think it's important for everyone. I just think that we have just, you know, lost sight of, 
you know what what that looks like i suppose because we've been we've been fed this and it is a lie because all the way through every generation really all the people that we've all looked up to in the past have all had eight or nine lovers on the side you know or and it's just that they that, that they were better at not getting caught or i mean look henry the had eight wives so there you go um we're not made to be to be monogamous the whole a whole way and I think that porn serves a, I mean, you know, there's obviously there's levels of it, as I said, you know, there's, uh, you know, uh, people that are willing like yourself and that are comfortable and this is a life choice that you've made and you're doing well from it, then that's your, that's up to you. Is it something mm -hmm. I would want my daughter to do? No, not particularly, not from, but for many other reasons, more, you know, and probably my own selfish ones, which would be, you know, I'd be, I, you know. I'm wondering about how, how you go to school, which is what I asked you and how you have a future going on. But then you have two kids and you've been married 14 years, which is amazing. But that's a special kind of guy too, that, that is so confident in himself that he can be married to you and not worry about you. Because I'm sure a lot of men looking the way you do, do fall in love with you. And I think you know, all of this thing, it is, it's all so mental that the wellness aspect of it, I think that people need, do need to be reconditioned, that it's not this big, shocking, awful thing, that if, you know, I, I, psychedelics, I, you know, I, I, I haven't done myself, but I, I was interested in trying ayahuasca once. Um, but as you said, I, I know it's kind of one, one size fits all, but um, it's meant to be amazing. But I do think that, you know, it's just this thing of letting go that we're, we as humans are so bad at just letting go and going with the flow and losing your inhibitions, which is, I guess, what you do. So I'm, I presume, and it's the same in business as it is in sex, as it is in everything else, because you have to be prepared to let go um, in every aspect of your life to be successful, to, you know, not worry about what other people think. So I guess in that respect, I completely understand the connection, you know, um, and it's it's a fascinating one. Like, what how, what does a wellness retreat? What does it look like then? So, what what if I come to you? What what happens? So it depends on. Um, well, right now we have one shaman that we've been working with for a really long time, and we just got introduced within the last probably year and a half to. I guess you could call him like one of the original psychonauts. Like he went to Harvard with Ram Dass and Tim Leary, and he's really good friends with Deepak Chopra. Like he's just very in that world. He's in his seventies and uh, he's got his facility and he leads everything. So you go and like each, each retreat kind of has a theme. So the last one was love your life. And it was all about like rediscovering the love within yourself and not looking for it externally, which I think a lot of us do, whether it's through likes or comments or how many friends we have or whatever it is, like how the number on the scale, like there's how how well my kids listening that day right we will always look for these external points of validation for our happiness so a lot of it was just like rediscovering that you have this endless well of happiness within yourself and to rediscover just you could be in the thralls of heartbreak but like you are so fucking happy to have that human experience and and to love that moment for all that it is it's not that happiness is this it's a polarity that only exists without sadness or sorrow, sorrow or rage or whatever. It's, it's all of it. And you can be happy with all of that. So you kind of have four days of super, super long days and they are structured kind of like lectures. And then you will have like a meditation and a fireside chat and then meals together. And this kind of goes on for a few days. And then the last day is usually the sacrament. So whatever it is that he prescribes you. So not everyone gets a psychedelic and not everyone gets the same thing so he kind of throughout those four days can hone in on what it is that you're dealing with and what is going to be the best for you and I think that that's a much um that's a much more honest approach than a lot of other people because again it's just like this is for everyone and it's not it's not everything is for everyone it's tailored for you um, right exactly is, is it something that if you are prescribed just prescribe something and then you all sit together and you know everyone's with you when you do it or it's private private so um he, it's a huge property and then you basically pick out your spot of where you're going to hang out and do your meditation because he encourages you to meditate during the process you're allowed to like walk around of course and go explore 
Um, it's a beautiful piece of property, but someone will pick like near trees. Someone will pick up on the top deck where you can see the ocean. It's just scattered about. Some people are dancing through the fields and that's like the way that they're experiencing it. Other people are like these like very Zen Buddhist monks and they're just in internal. Their eyes are closed. They've got headphones on. So you kind of pick your designated spot and you can't go into someone else's spot, but you're allowed to go into like the um, the communal areas and that's fine, but you like, you pick your spot. So if you want to be by yourself and experience it alone, you can, and then you have people, facilitators walking around, bringing you water, making sure you're okay. Um, adjusting doses if you need to. So it's really hands-on. And what, what are you teaching yourself? So, cause I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, you know, like for relationships, as I said, I believe that porn can actually strengthen a relationship in some mm -hmm. way um and what are your views on that and do you teach things like this like do you do you speak about not just the adult industry but how it affects relationships because you know and to try and take away the negative stigma so i mostly do that through my podcast eventually i would love to hold like a women's only retreat that focuses a lot on like reclamation and pleasure and um reintegration and then just like getting down to the first principles of why you have all of this shame and what does your your authentic sexual expression look like because that's different for everyone right like most people are not going to take my path and that's fine. And that's probably for the best, but everyone has a different expression and we don't know what ours is because it's been kind of calcified by our parents, calcified by society, calcified by like the last couple of hundred years. So we don't really know what is ours. So how do you get down to like, what do you honestly want for you? And then also getting to a place where you can just discern that's not for me but I don't have to judge it. I don't have to um, like put this a permanent A on my forehead to make sure that everyone knows I'm the town for like, that's not necessary, right? Like you can just say not for me. And that's just not a place that we're at right now. But I think when you look at porn or anything that's um, erotica or uh, pleasure based, it's, it's a tool and it's how do you want to use it? Like you can use a match to build a fire or burn a building down. The match isn't wrong. It's, how you use it and it's the same i think with pornography so it's it doesn't have a charge on its own it's the way that the, that you utilize it and, and some people are doing eight hour, hours a day and they're using it as a means to escape and avoid their responsibilities and their duties as a lover as a husband as a whatever a provider and that's not good but then there's other people like yourself and you're like i'm using this as a tool like to spice up my relationship to keep it alive right to keep it exciting to keep it fresh and that's different so it's the same tool but it, it's just different uses and then you get to decide if you want to use it at all and then what does that look like so i think it's just kind of it's very like lazy superficial surface thinking to just say it's bad because like what does that even mean what does that even there's so many you different bad experiences before because you, you you make it sound fine and you know and great and it's a career choice and you love you know you're good and you know you've had nothing but good experiences but have, have there, there is a dark side there must be i mean you must have like you, i and, and i don't mean it doesn't have to be uh you know terrible but you can wake up anyone like i mean girls have woken up with men that they don't like you know in normal relationships and gone what have i done like there must be dark days Oh, for sure. I never like claimed that everything was butterflies and roses. Like I, I actually left because I felt like I just kept having bad experience after bad experience. And for me, it just was, I always said I would leave when I wasn't having fun anymore. I would always leave when it just felt like I wasn't aligned with it anymore. And it got to that point where it was just abundantly clear. I wasn't supposed to be in the industry anymore. And I left and started self-producing. Um, and I think the unfortunate thing is, is if you're operating within the industry, which is basically like a monopoly, you don't have a lot of choice. You don't have a voice. It's very easy for something to happen on set. And then you feel the pressure, like you can't say anything because then you're blacklisted, which actually happened to me. So I went to Twitter. Um, it was like right before I got fired. So I was a contract star. So I worked for one company for years and it was just like a lot of bad practices were happening. And I'd see it on set with smaller girls and, I was like, well, she doesn't have a following. I have a following. And if they're doing this to me, I can't imagine what they're doing to someone from like Louisiana. And this is her first day on set. And I just have like this fighter spirit within me. I always have. So if I see something, I get like very worked up. It's very easy to get me passionate about something. 
And so I went to Twitter about it. <clears throat> and then I got a call from the office the next day. And they're like, you were fired, blacklisted from every single company. I was terrified. I was like, my, I did all of this. I cannot go back into society. Like they won't welcome me. I can't have a regular job. Like what, what am I going to do? And then I just quickly pivoted and said, I'll just do it myself. And this is before OnlyFans. This is before anyone was really using third-party platforms to monetize their content. You kind of were beholden to these big companies. So I think one of the beautiful things that's happened in the last couple of years is up, is platforms like OnlyFans and other um, like many vids, et cetera, where you can own your content and produce it in a very safe way where you have full agency and not be beholden to like this giant machine. And obviously like those have their pitfalls as well, right? Like everything's online. It's hard to like authenticate whether that scene was consensual, right? Like they're getting a lot better with paperwork and with um, like ID to make sure you're like you're of age. But for example, so we, I started an agency and we represent like purely adult creators right now. And I had some women coming to me that were locked out of their accounts. They had like these basically digital pimps that would sign them up for an account. They'd own the email, they'd own the bank account, and the girl didn't have access to it at all. So they're making this content, which they're cons consenting to, but then they're getting locked out. And it's like, if you don't sleep with me, then you can't get into your account. I'm not going to pay you. So we had this happen a couple of times. And thankfully, we knew people within the company and we were able to get the accounts taken from these like male, like these bad um, actors and give it back to the adult creator and teach them better practices. Like, how do you have sovereignty? How do you become undeniable? Yeah dangerous for you because um no i don't think so no i mean yeah i don't think so it's international so like this one person was in um south america it's like what, what's going to happen and at the end of the day like i have my i have everything around me sorted right like so i am a public figure i had some really troubling like uh stalker stuff happen just last week so i mean we we have protocols so I feel pretty secure within my space. But also it's like, if you see something wrong, you have to do something. I can't operate out of, out of fear or say, like, look at this woman who's, she was taking care of her whole family, like her older mom, she had children, she had extended family and she was the sole provider. And this man was locking her out of her own account and was extorting her. I'm like, I can't not do anything, especially if I have the resources to do that. And you've got children now. So, you know, how do you feel? I, sorry, you have boys or girls? Two boys. Two boys, okay. So how would you feel about, I mean, I've got two boys too, um, about um, them and porn and, you know, the industry? And um, four boys, because obviously, you know, now, and they're, are you going to tell them that you're in the industry? When would you do that? All of these things, because, you know, my boys are 13, so I've got to, I haven't got long before they discover all of these things, I presume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mine are much younger, so I have, a little, I have time on my side for now, but um, yeah, I, I tend to be fully transparent. I believe like we don't lie in the house. We don't, I'm not ashamed of anything. There's nothing to hide. I also, I don't want someone else to be the first person to introduce that fact to them. Like that's my responsibility. That's my husband's responsibility. It's not like some jackass kid who pulls up a scene on their iPhone, right? Like that, that means I failed and I didn't see that he, they, they were ready for that conversation. <clears throat> but I think when it comes down to how are they going to respond to that? Obviously I have no idea. They're their own person. Like, and they're both so different already, right? Like you come into the world who you are. I really think that obviously there's some nurturing that happens, but I'm just saying like, like your essence of who you are is who you are and how you're going to kind of deal with hardship and resiliency and all of that is, it's kind of fixed to a point. Um, but yeah, I think when it comes to how you have the relationship with like sexuality and pleasure and like their body, one of the things I was hearing was a lot of um, boys have a lot of shame when like the first time that they go to masturbate, like someone walks in on them and like the parent out of their own embarrassment will start scolding the kid, punishing the kid. What are you doing? Stop that. Um, like, so like not doing that kind of stuff. I think when it comes to and again, they're super young, like toddler age, but we use like proper terminology for body parts. And there's a whole host of reasons that you do that. So if you're trying to protect, protect them from a predator, you want them to have the language. You want them to be able to say like penis and you want them to say vulva because that shows the predator that they're in a household where 
the uh, sex sexuality is discussed, body parts are discussed. Uh, so that child is um, a bad target because if something happens, that child is probably going to tell their parents. Whereas if you have someone that doesn't have the proper terminology and like they're kind of weird and awkward when they talk about body parts, like, oh, that that family doesn't talk about that. That's a, that's a kid that I can go after. So that's like step number one. And it's crazy because you'll see a lot of parents that are really uncomfortable just saying that word around their child, but properly identifying body parts is huge and not making it weird or shameful or silly. Like, no, it's just a body part, right? So I think like those are a couple of just staples, like that's like the foundation of it. Um, but yeah, I think it's, you get to, again, decide your relationship to sexuality, obviously go over consent, go over pleasure, his pleasure, her pleasure, all of these things are okay. And, um, I don't know. It's like you only have so much influence and they're out with their friends and out in the rest of the world. So within the house, it's just instilling that like this is a gift and it's a big responsibility and pornography is for adults. It's not for children. Obviously, unfortunately, there's no paywalls on pretty much anything. So it's way too accessible. I think most people would agree with that. Um, if someone is showing you this kind of content you have the right to say no right like so that that's also a form of consent it's a huge it is going to be a huge um boulder that i'm going to have to push and i i don't know i'm still sorting it out it's a difficult one i mean you know i'm i'm with you as well like i i'm i don't shy away from anything in my house um discussing things and i don't say anything's bad or, um with, with the bodies or sex or anything like this um, you know, I have a 17 year old daughter, so, you know, um, and she's very open with me about life. So, which is a, an amazing place to be. So I never want to be in a position where I make her feel shame for anything, you know, um, so mm -hmm. the, the communication is always open. Um, and then, as I said, you know, I have my husband 20 years younger, so I'm living all of this again with him in a way. Um, so it's like all my old, um, in, not insecurities, whatever, you know, the, 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 the things that I was taught, I've actually managed to let go of. And I think that more and more people should, um, let go of. And as I said, you know, I think today's been fascinating because I do think a lot of this, you know, um, fear of porn and all of this comes down to just personal confidence. Um, and, and, you know, if a woman is confident and loves herself and the husband loves her, he's not, porn is not the problem. Porn is, you know, he's not running off with, with the girl behind the screen, you know, um, and uh, all of us women are all, you know, running and watching whatever it was, 365 days. And that was okay. And, you know, drooling over that. So I don't see the difference particularly. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I, I actually, as, as you have said, think that it's it's not a bad thing it's not a bad thing if the it's controlled the right way you're in control and you you want to be there mm -hmm. yeah I agree and I think if you have issues with your your partner your husband whatever it is and you're just seeing porn is like the boogeyman and once that goes away the relationship is going to be fine I think that that's very misleading and if you truly want to fix the relationship if you want more attention if you want more sensuality then berating him over something also isn't going to work out. Like try how can you approach it with more softness, more surrender, um, giving him the benefit of the doubt. And it's interesting because it's, I do this even sometimes and it's how often does your partner or your husband go to make some kind of contact or connection with you? And you're like, Ugh, I'm not in the mood. Ugh, I don't want to bother. Right. So often. And it's like, well, of course. So do you want to give him an outlet or do you want to maybe have more sex or have more connection and reframe the way that you look at it? So, I mean, it's up to you, but it's certainly porn's not the problem. And I would look at the dynamics within the relationship and like, what does that feel like? And what does that look like on a daily basis in like a really honest way? I think that's a very good place to leave this. It's porn is not the problem. I think, you know, it, as I said, you can use it as a tool to help you. Um, respice your life, or you can use it as a tool to get out to get out of having to do it quite as often. Um, mm -hmm. Either way, it can be positive. It doesn't have to be a negative, and it's just like anything else. It's mindsets, how you look at things. Um, I have had the best time with you. This has been fascinating. Um, really, really enjoyed meeting you because you actually have made me 
feel that I'm, I feel a lot better. I feel right about the way I feel about porn, which is my girlfriends are like, how are you so cool with letting him watch it? And I'm like, I, I don't like it. Like, I really don't care. For me, it's like he's watching the news. <laughs> well, thank you for having me on. This was wonderful. It was great meeting you. And hopefully your listeners took something uh, fun or valuable away from this. Great meeting you. Tell everybody how they can find you and um, on Instagram and all the socials. So it's Candace Horback on all the socials. Chatting with Candace is my podcast. And um, yeah, I'm mostly on Twitter. That's like where I spend most of my social media time. It's my favorite one. Wow. That that's that that you've got balls because Twitter is where all the trolls go. <laughs> Thank you, Candace. I've really, really enjoyed having you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode.